بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد One of the greatest diseases and tragedies upon a society and an individual is when a person is living with the disease of arrogance, the disease of takabbur, the viewpoint and perspective on life where I am only right and everyone else is wrong. The person who does not take advice from other people. The person who's so arrogant that they view that only they are right and everyone else is wrong. This is a moral vice. This is a disease, a social disease that many individuals have. And the religion of Islam, one of the duties and objectives and mission missions of the religion of Islam is that it came to rid the nation of these social diseases, of these spiritual diseases. Islam is not just a religion that connects me with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayers, fasting and hajj rituals connect me with God. This is one aspect of Islam. But there's another dimension, another very important aspect, and that is the dimension of dealing with the spiritual diseases, the disease of racism, the disease of bigotry, the problems of prejudice and arrogance. These are major problems, and we see that the Qur'an discusses these problems throughout the whole Qur'an. In fact, the Qur'an draws a picture that the first sin the first act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that took place was the sin of arrogance, takabbur. And that was by Iblis. When Allah ordered Iblis, Satan, to bow and prostrate to Adam, but he, his arrogance did not allow him. He says, خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ You created me from fire and you created him from soil. I am better than him. This was prejudice, this was bigotry, this was arrogance, this was racism. It all sums up to the act of viewing yourself better than other people. And this is what Islam came to remove. Rasulullah, he says, He says, I was sent 
to perfect the character of people so that people live upright, so that people stand for values, so that people don't oppress one another, so that we uphold justice and uphold values. This is religion, my dear brothers and sisters. Because all of the problems in life, all of the diseases and problems that we've fallen in life and the world today, if you want to sum it up to one major disease, it could all go back to arrogance. Today, the wars and the bloodshed and the fighting. Why? Because one group of people, they regard themselves better than another group of people. One person, he sees, themsel he sees himself, he's more worthy than other people. And then it causes the bloodshed and the fighting and the war. And you see, it creates a polarization in society where people, they're very far from one another. And currently speaking, the United States is going through this polarization. The United States is facing this problem. Perhaps some say that the United States have, has never faced this division ever since the Civil War. Ever since the Civil War. Where people, you see them over a football player because he decided to kneel down during the national anthem. They're coming and they're burning Nikes and they're burning their shoes because of a football player, Kaepernick. Isn't this a type of extremism? Isn't this a type of bigotry? Isn't this a type of polarization that's going on in society? Of course, every society, every system, they come and they try to offer solutions to these problems. But we find that even in, the dem in a so-called democratic society, a, a country where people are free, where people have freedom of voice and, uh, and opinion, you find that there is, this still, there is still this bigotry and racism and oppression that's going on. So maybe, perhaps, we should go and look at what other systems have to say, what other ideologies have to say. A lot of us, we go and we look at what this person says and what this theory says and what this, this way of life says, and we neglect to look at what the most important important theory is and that is the theory of religion religion also offers a way of life religion also offers a system but rarely do people go back to religion people will go and talk about systems and ways of living but they reject the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who created us he knows what's best for us and he knows what we need and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what are the solutions to life's problems, the problems that we face in life. Religion deals with these problems. Religion does not just teach me how to pray and fast and rituals. Religion teaches me how to purify my heart. Religion tells me to take out the hatred from my heart, to take out the bigotry and the negative sentiments in my heart. And that is the definition of religiosity. In a time, in an era where people are focused on differences, this person is white, this person's black, this person's brown, this person's from this country, what does the Quran say? The Quran says, Ya ayyuhannas inna khalaqnakum min dhaka'in wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu. While people and societies are focused on differences, and kicking people out and building a wall here and there and doing this and that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, O oh people, we created you from a male and female. And we created you in tribes and nations. For what? وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلْ لِتَعَارَفُوا So that you fight with one another? No. The Quran says so that you get to know one another. So that you reach higher potentials once you talk to one another. Once you engage with one another, this is the only way we advance as a society, as a race, as a human race. And that is when we deal with one another, when we cooperate with one another. And then Allah says, Inna akramakum Allah atqakum. The system of judging who's better and who's not better is through piety. And who is the one who's able to look at the piety? It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah is able to look at what's in our hearts. In another verse, Allah talks about the differences in language and culture and races 
as one of the miracles of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ And one of the signs of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ The differences in the languages and color, this is a miracle from Allah. This is one of the signs of Allah. While we, if we see someone who's a different color, someone who's from a different nation, we come and we degrade that person and we look down upon that person, Allah says, this is one of the signs of Allah. This person is one of the signs of Allah. So we see that the Islamic perspective, the religious perspective, it comes and it unites people. And this is why we have to go back to religion. In a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says, مَن تَعَصَّبَ أَوْ تُعُصِّبَ لَهْ فَقَدْ خَلَعَ رَبَقَ الْإِيمَانِ مِنْ عُنُقِهِ He says, the one who has some arrogance, the one who has pride, unjustified pride, unjustified arrogance, viewing themselves better than someone else. Or someone else, they come and they vote for this person or they give this person a role just because this person was from this particular race, this particular nationality. And then this person is separated from Iman. This person is separated from Islam. What does Islam look at? Does Islam and God look at my, my race and my nationality? Of course not. Allah looks at what's in your heart. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ The day of judgment, only the one who goes to Allah with a sound, purified heart, that is the person that will be a successful person on that day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you by your taqwa. Allah judges you by your action, not by your race and your color. In a, in a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he gives us the criteria how to judge people, how to know whether this person is good or this person is not good. Should I look at this person's race? Should I look at this person's nationality? Should I look at how much money this person has? No. Rasulullah says, لا تنظروا إلى كثرة صلاتهم وصومهم وكثرة الحج والمعروف وطنطنتهم بالليل وَلَكِنْ انظروا إلى صدق الحديث وأداء الأمانة رسول الله, he goes a step further. He says, don't even look at how much this person prays. Don't even look at how, much, how many times this person has gone to hajj. Don't look at the times, the, the quantity of fasting that this person does. No. Instead, look at their truthfulness. صدق الحديث, being a truthful, being an honest person, and Ada' al amana someone who could be trusted. And then the Rasulullah Rasul says, why? Why, don't look at, why should you not look at these? The, the number of times that this person prays. The, the hadith says, perhaps some people, they are accustomed to prayer. If they don't pray, they're going to feel the wahsha. They're going to feel the loneliness. But they continue pray and they keep disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, Rasulullah says, look at their amana. Can this person be trusted? Does this person continue to lie when they speak? This is what you look at. And this is how Islam purifies the hearts. This is how Islam removes bigotry and prejudice and hatred from the hearts. Rasulullah tells Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he tells him, إِيَّاكَ وَالْغِيبَةِ فَإِنَّ الْغِيبَةِ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الزِّنَى he tells him, Oh Abu Dhar, be careful of backbiting and gossip. Because gossip and backbiting is worse than zina. It's worse than adultery. This is how Islam came to purify the hearts. Now, some people might come and tell you, or tell me, you sit and you say these things, but you go and you look at religions, Go and look at most of the fighting and most of the division that's going on in the world today. It's caused by religions. It's caused by religious people. It's caused either sectarianism, religious fighting, dispute, religions. They come and they say, I'm mu'min, I'm a believer, I'm Muslim, I'm going to paradise. Anyone who doesn't believe in what I'm believing goes, goes to hell. 
They come and they tell you it's religions that cause these. And Islam is accused, Islam is on the forefront, accused of being a religion that causes division and bigotry. Is that true? Of course not. Anyone who says this does not know Islam. Anyone who says this has not re re read and learned about the Islam of Rasulullah. Rasulullah, the Islam of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Islam of Imam al Hussein. Yes, perhaps they went and they learned about the Islam of Bani Umayyah, the army that killed Imam al Hussein. But you go and you look at Rasulullah, you see Rasulullah was able to remove the bigotry and the hatred and the racism from the society that he was living in. And it was a society that was filled with problems, filled with vices. They would kill one another, they would raid one another, they would attack one another. They could not stand one another. They were all arrogant. Two tribes, they fight with one another, a war that lasts over 10 years. The Aus and the Khazraj. Rasulullah, he was able to unite them. Rasulullah was able to gather everyone despite their racial differences. Despite their differences, he was able to bring them under the umbrella of Iman, under the umbrella of Islam, under the umbrella of Taqwa. Rasulullah, he brought Bilal al-Habashi, Bilal the Ethiopian. He brings Salman al-Farisi, Salman who was the Persian. He brings Suhaib al-Rumi, the Roman Suhaib. And he brings Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, an Arab. He was able to gather all of these people together. He was able to unite them. When people came and they started accusing Salman and talking bad about Salman, they said, he's a Persian, we don't want him. What did Rasulullah say? Rasulullah said his famous statement, Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt. Salman is one of us, the ahl al-bayt. Right away he shut all the racism that was going on. When people saw Bilal, he placed Bilal to be the spokesperson, to be the person who calls the adhan. A lot of the Arabs, they came and they tell Rasulullah, Oh Rasulullah, we are Arabs, let us call the adhan. Why are you bringing someone who can't even pronounce correctly? Rasulullah, he tells them, Sinu Bilalin Sheenun and Allah. When Bilal, he used to want to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he used to say, Ashhadu. He wasn't able to pronounce. So Rasulullah tells them, Sinu Bilalin Sheenun and Allah. When Bilal says, Ashhadu, Allah hears it as Ashhadu. And Rasulullah was able to stop this. So Rasulullah was able to unite the Ummah. And this is what Islam does. And this is what the Quran orders. But yes, there is still racism, there's still bigotry even within the Muslim Ummah today. But is that Islam's fault? Can you blame Rasulullah for that? No. This is, these, there are people who were bigots, there are people who were racists, even during the time of Rasulullah and until today, that problem still persists. Now, some people they come and they say, no, but you Muslims, because you practice your faith, you seclude yourself from society and therefore this causes tension and this causes sectarianism and this causes problems. Now of course, this is a wrong accusation. For example, right now in France, if a lady, if a sister, she wants to wear hijab and she wants to go to public school, they'll tell her you have to take off your hijab or you fit in society. If you want to fit into society, our image, our, our perspective, then you have to take off your hijab. Otherwise, you're a bigot and you're causing sectarianism and you're causing problems. But that's a wrong approach. Because we have a faith. We have a religion and we have the freedom to practice that. And we believe that our faith is the right faith. It's the right approach. So therefore, we have to hold on to it. وَإِنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلِ There is one path towards Allah. Some people they'll come and they'll tell you, no, there's religious pluralism. You're right, you're going to heaven, you're right, you're right, you're right. Everyone's right. You do whatever you want to do. There is a lot of people, even some Muslims today, they'll come and they'll tell you this. They'll tell you, do whatever you want to do. And if I want to compromise my faith to please other people, then that's okay. You find today some Muslims, they say, I have to, you know, for the sake of my job, in order to fit in, I have to do everything that my work requires for me. Even if that means, for example, I go to dinner, I go to lunch, and there's alcohol being offered. Or some people, they say, I have to fit in, so that means I can't pray in front of people. I can't practice hijab in front of people. 
I have to accept all of the vices in society. Some people, they'll come and they'll tell you, you know what? We're going to agree with every vice that people are doing. For example, the homosexual community, we're going to agree with them. We're going to be, we're going to be okay with them and we're going to support them. And some Muslims, they come and they put on their social media the rainbow as their icon. Why? Because they're oppressed and we're oppressed and we're all together. Is this a true approach? Is this the right approach that we should have? To be the mouthpiece of other people? Well, we have our own ideology. We have our own belief. Why should I compromise my faith to please other people or to fit into society? That's not, that's not fitting in. That's le letting go of your identity. And there is this identity crisis that some Muslims have today. Some Muslims, they say, in order for me to be accepted, in order for me to be voted for, in order for us to have power, then we have to agree with every wrong that's going on in society. We have to vote for even someone who's filled with vices. No, we can't do that. And this is what we learned from Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. Otherwise, Imam al-Husayn, someone could have came and told him, Yazid is a Muslim. Yazid, he's a leader of a Muslim country, a Muslim state. Let him be, and you're, you're going to be safe. And you're going to fit in, and you're going to belong, and you're not going to be hurt. But Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, he saw that he had a duty to defend the truth and stand for the truth. Yes, Islam teaches us tolerance, religious tolerance. But Islam does not give me the permission to sacrifice and compromise my own faith and my own belief. Yes, be tolerant of other people. Respect people for their humanity. Respect people for who they are as a human. But don't come and be the mouthpiece for that person. Don't come and support a, a, something that someone is doing which is wrong, which goes against your belief, which goes against your religious system. And this is what Imam al Hussein did. Now, how do we deal with the bigotry that we face in society? Today, especially in the United States, we live in an era of Islamophobia. It's obvious that we live in an era of Islamophobia. And there's a lot of bigotry. And there are many Muslims that will come and they will tell you, I, can't, I don't have the freedom to practice my faith. I feel the oppression. I feel people look at me. I feel people give me a different image. I'm not comfortable praying, for example, in the airport. I'm not comfortable wearing hijab. I'm not comfortable practicing my faith. I have to change my identity in order to fit in. What are some solutions? How should we deal with this bigotry that a lot of people deal with? And perhaps it's the younger generation that deal with it the most in the schools, in the elementary school, in middle school, in high school, in the university. Because the adults, they've already developed their personality, their identity. They don't, fa they don't deal with it as much. It's the younger generation that deals with it the most. The first piece of advice is that every single one of us as a Muslim, as a believer, we should know our self-worth. When you have chosen to follow the religion of Islam and live the life of a Muslim, and that is after you have reached the conclusion that this is the right religion, not because your parents told you, but because you came up with this conclusion and you used your logic and your common sense to reach this conclusion, so that now that you know you're on the right path, why should you compromise? Why should you let go of the haqq that you're on? And you have the best role models. You have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi as a role model. Someone who was never shaken. Someone who never compromised his faith and his values. Yes, Rasulullah was very tolerant of others. And inshallah we're going to talk about in the upcoming nights the relationship, the Islamic perspective of Islam towards non-Muslims. And that is a, a relationship of peace and love and compassion. However, that doesn't mean that you should let go of your own identity and your own belief system because you have that belief system and you're on the right track. So why compromise? Amir al-Mu'mineen describes Rasulullah in Dua al-Sabah. He says, وَصَلِّ اللَّهُمَّ عَلَى الدَّلِيلِ إِلَيْكَ فِي اللَّيْلِ الْأَلْيَلِ وَالْمَاسِكِ بِأَسْبَابِكَ بِحَبْلِ الشَّرَفِ الْأَطْوَلِ وَالنَّاصِعِ الْحَسَبِ فِي ذِرْوَةِ الْكَاهِلِ الْأَعْبَلِ Rasulullah was Thabit al-Qadam. 
Rasulullah was firm. Nothing was moving Rasulullah. They come, they tell Rasulullah, we're, we're going to give you money. We're going to give you women. We're going to give you power. We're going to give you so many things. Rasulullah did not let go. Rasulullah did not compromise his faith for all of that. Despite all of the accusations, despite all of the harassments that Rasulullah dealt with. All of the prophets were assaulted. Musa, they used to accuse him. They accused him of zina. They accused him of adultery. Musa, he comes and he tells, he tells Allah one day. He tells Allah, he says, Ilahi, stop people from talking about me. You're the God. Tell people to stop talking about me. Allah tells him, oh Musa, this is something that I don't have for myself. People talk about God every day. Did God stop people from talking about God? He says, oh Musa, this is something that I don't have for myself. You're asking for something that I don't even have. Be patient, oh Musa. Deal with it. Be firm. This is what iman is. This is what being a mu'min is. It means being firm despite other people standing in your way. And when we come and we gather in Muharram, in Ashura, what do we learn? We learn about a group of men that were firm for what they believe in. That stood for what they believe in. Despite 30,000 on the other side, they came and they gathered to kill them. What do we learn from Ashura? Al-Abbas, they cut off his right hand. What does he say? He says, Wallahi in qata'tumu yameeni inni uhami abadan an deeni. He says, you've cut off my hand, but I'm going to defend my faith forever. Ali al-Akbar, Imam al Hussein tells him, we're, we're getting closer to death. He says, la nubali. Waqa'na ala al-mawt am waqa'a al-mawt alayna. We don't care. He, said, he asks his father, alasna ala al-haq, are we not on the right track? Imam al Hussein tells him, yes, we're on the right track. Ali al-Akbar says, we don't care. We go to death or death comes to us. Another companion of Imam al Hussein by the name of Al Hajjaj ibn Masruq al Ju'fi. This man in the middle of the battle. In the middle of the battle, he stops the war and he's drenched with blood, according to the Maqtal. He's drenched with blood. His, his body is filled with wounds. He stops. He goes to Imam al Hussein. He has something very important to tell Imam al Hussein. Is he going to tell him he's tired? Is he going to tell him he's in pain? No. He tells Imam al-Hussein, Oh my master, I'm privileged. I'm blessed that I'm with you right now. While he's bleeding, he, begun, he goes and he begins to recite the epic to Imam al-Hussein. Al-yawma alqa jaddaka al-nabiyya Thumma abaka dhannada aliyya Thaka alladhi na'rifuhu al-wasiyya In the middle of the battle, he goes and he tells Imam al Hussein, I'm going to meet your grandfather soon. I'm going to meet your father soon. Imam al Hussein tells him, Yes, I will meet my grandfather very soon as well. I will meet my father very soon as well. These are a group of men that were firm for what they believe in. They did not compromise their identity, they did not compromise their faith. And this is what we learn from Ashura. Second, my dear brothers and sisters, when we deal with bigotry, we should not stoop down to their level. We should not go down to what other people are doing. If they're cursing at me, if they're treating me in a bad way, my religion tells me not to do that. My religion tells me to deal with them in a better way. My religion tells me to deal with my enemies in a better way. Treat people with your morality, not with their morality. Treat people with your way of lifestyle, not their lifestyle. Imam Ali alayhi salam, how many times was he cursed? Imam Ali, the first Muslim, the first believer, the first to support the religion of Islam, they used to curse him day and night. So some of the companions of Imam Ali, they come and they say, we are going to curse them as well. We're going to curse the enemies as well. Imam Ali, he tells them, Inni akrah lakum an takunu sababin. He says, I don't want you to be like them, people that use foul language. I don't want that from you. You're on the party of Imam Ali. You're the Shia of Ali. Do what you are supposed to do. Allah is going to judge you for who you are, not for what other people did. On the day of Ashura, they came to Imam al-Hussein. 
Shimr, the man who killed Imam al Hussein, he came very close to the tent of Imam al Hussein. So one of the companions of the Imam, he tells the Imam, let me shoot him with an arrow right now. I'll kill him, that's it, it'll be over. Imam al Hussein, he says, Inni akrah an abda'ahum biqital. He says, I don't want to be the one to begin the war. I don't want history to record that Hussein was the one who began the war. This is the second. Third, my dear brothers and sisters, whenever there's a negative scenario going on, whenever you're treated badly, whenever you see a bigot dealing with you in a wrong way, take that as an opportunity. That's a gift from Allah to you. That's an opportunity for you to come and show that person who you truly are. When people judge you and accuse you in a wrong way, that is Allah giving you the opportunity to show them who you really are. Show them your self-worth. Show them what your religion teaches you. This is an opportunity, my dear brothers and sisters. And Allah tells us in the Quran, لا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة. The good deed is not evil to the bad deed. ادفع, push, repel evil with good. ادفع بالتي هي أحسن. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Repel evil with good. If someone, there's animosity with that person, كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ He will be your best friend. This person will love you. This person will begin to respect you. This is how the Ahlul Bayt were. This is how Rasulullah was. A man comes from Sham. He sees Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. And this man is influenced and brainwashed by the propaganda machine that was started by Muawiyah and Bani Umayyah. So he sees Imam al Hassan and he begins to curse at the Imam. He begins to curse at Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam al Hassan, he looks at him, he smiles, and he tells him, I think you have mistaken me for someone else. You seem like a stranger here. If you need a place to stay, Come stay with us. If you need a horse, I will give you a horse. If you need food, I will give you. Why don't you come and stay with us and we will take care of you and we will honor you. The man was shocked. He began to cry and he says, Allahu a'lam haythu yaj'al rasalatah. Allah knows exactly who he keeps his message with. And it's people like you, the Ahlul Bayt. Don't fight with people. Take every negative scenario as an opportunity to show people who you are. In a hadith from Rasulullah, he says, nas man mira wa in kana muhiqqa. The person who has the most fear of Allah, who, who, does not, who does not transgress, is the person who does not argue, even if they're right. Sometimes you're right. Don't go and argue all the time. Allah tells you how to preach. How to deliver the faith. ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. Invite for the sake of your Lord with wisdom and good admonishments. And if they continue to debate with you, then debate in the best way possible. The fourth point, my dear brothers and sisters, is forgiving people. It's okay to forgive. When someone treated you badly, when someone hurt you, when someone oppressed you, be the forgiving person. You know what happens when you're forgiving? You're just going to bring ease to yourself. You're just going to live an e easy lifestyle. You're going to bring comfort to yourself. That person, who's going to know whether that person, you're still angry, you can't sleep every night because of this, this person angered you. But if you decide to forgive that person, then you're going to be at peace with yourself. You're going to be at peace with other people. And Allah is going to see that you're forgiving. So therefore Allah is going to forgive you. Allah is going to forgive you for your other faults. The ones who control their anger. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And the ones who forgive other people. And Allah loves those who are muhsin, those who do good. Those who go out of their way to do good. Don't hold any hatred in your heart. 
Don't hold any grudges in your heart. Because the only one who's going to be hurt when you're holding a grudge is you. That other person is not going to feel it. You're going to be hurt. You're going to cause blood pressure and stress and diabetes and all of these things. You're going to hurt yourself. Live at peace. Be at peace with others. Forgive others. Forgive yourself and Allah will forgive. This is what we learn from the Ahlul Bayt salam. Imam al Hussein, the man who caused the murder of Imam al Hussein and he brought Imam al Hussein to Karbala was Al Hurr bin Yazid al Riyahi. He stopped in the face of Imam al Hussein, but on the day of Ashura, he realized he made a mistake. So he goes back walking to the Imam and he apologizes to the Imam. He's crying, he's apologizing. What could Imam al Hussein do right now? Imam al Hussein could have told him, You're the one who caused all of this, get out of my face. Imam al Hussein tells him, In tubta tab Allahu alayk. If you are sincere, then Allah will forgive you. This was the fourth point. And the fifth point, my dear brothers and sisters, is patience. Patience is bliss. Patience is the key to happiness. And Allah says, Inna Allah sabirin If you want Allah to be on your side, if you want Allah to be with you despite all of the bigotry and the hatred that you see in your life, be patient. Be patient. Allah is going to stand with you. Allah is going to support you. And this is what we learn from Imam al Hussein and from the Ahlul Bayt. One of the ladies, one of the honorable ladies who was patient was Ummul Banin, the mother of Abbas and the brothers of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Four of her sons died in one day, in one hour. What happens to a mother? The heart of the mother, my dear brothers and sisters, is very fragile. The heart of the mother, she would rather see herself and her body be in pain, but she can't see what her children go through. If she sees her children in pain, that breaks her heart. Umm al banin she lost four of her sons. Four of her sons in one day. When Bishr ibn Hathlam, he comes back to, Med to Medina after the arrival of the caravan of Imam al Hussein. Imam Zain al Abidin, he tells him, Oh Bishr, go enter Medina and mourn and announce that my father was slain. Go and let the world know what has happened. So Bishr ibn Hadlam, he goes ahead of the camp, of, of the caravan, and he begins to call out, Ya Ahla Yathrib, la muqam lakum biha. O oh, people of Yathrib, O oh, people of the city of Rasulullah, this is not a city to live in anymore. They come out, they tell him, what has happened? What are you saying? What has happened? He begins to say, Ya Ahla Yathrib, la muqam lakum biha. قتل الحسين فأدمعي مدرار مدينة is not a city to live in anymore. Why? Because Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, the flower of Rasulullah, was slain. فأدمعي مدرار الجسم منه بكربلاء مضرج والرأس منه على القناة يدار أم البنين she's there she tells him oh Bishr what has happened tell me he tells her he asks who this lady is they they tell her this is Um Albanin, the brother of Abbas and the brothers of Abbas. He tells her, O oh, Um Albanin, Adam Allah, Lakil Ajr bi waladiki Abdullah. Your son Abdullah was slain. My condolences to you, O oh, Um Albanin. She tells him, O oh, Bishr, tell me about my son Hussein. He tells her, O oh, Um Albanin, Adam Allah, Lakil Ajr bi waladiki Jafar. Your son Jafar was killed. She tells him, tell me about my son Hussein. He tells her, Uthman. She tells him, Hussein. 
انت تزرع ام البنين عظم الله لك الاجر بولدك العباس عباس وصلين ثيرستي ان كربلاء شي تيلز هيم او او بيشر تيل مي اباوت ماي سن حسين سو هي تيلز هير يا ام البنين عظم الله لك الاجر بولدك الحسين او ام البنين حسين واز اولسو سلين ان كربلاء ام البنين شي جوز تو ذا هاوس اوف امام الحسين سيده زينب واز ذير ناو ذا وومن ذير جاذرد ان ذا امتي هاوس ذا هاوس ذات دوز نوت هاف ذا مان ان ات اني مور شي نوكس ذا دور زينب شي كمز شي ويلكمز هير ام البنين شي دوز نوت ريكوجنايز زينب اني مور شي تيلز هير او زينب از ذس يو انتي زينب الحاشميه زينب ريبلايز انا زينب المسبيه اي ام زينب ذات واز تيكن از ا بريزنر ذس از واي يو كانت ريكوجنايز مي اني مور ذس از واي اي لوك ديفرنت ناو لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا 